I should have seen this coming. Life was too perfect, especially at that moment. It was Friday evening on a beautiful summer day. My beer was ice cold as it slid down my throat. The Cubs were beating the Cardinals on the big screen, 7-2, in the fifth inning. My trusty German shepherd, Rice, lay curled up next to me and mostly slept, waking up and opening his eyes only when I let out a whoop of joy about the Cubs' success. Except for the television and my occasional shouts of joy, the house was silent. My wife, Tracy, was visiting a neighbor, and my 18-year-old son and 17-year-old daughter both spent the night visiting friends. It was just me and the dog, the booths, and a box of Corona in the refrigerator. Oh, yes, and limes. I don't bother with limes often, but I bought a couple this afternoon when I found out I'd be alone that evening. I feel good. I heard the front door open and close and assumed it was my wife returning from a visit to her old friend Lisa. I heard her move around the front of the house, but I didn't hear her call out to me in greeting, as she usually did. I thought it was a little strange. But at that exact moment, Cubs manager David Ross brought out his starting pitcher in the fourth inning when the Cubs had a big lead, causing me to explode with anger and wake up the dog once again. It must have been at least five minutes before Tracy finally made it to the living room. She looked thoughtful and perhaps nervous. She didn't come up to my chair and lean in for a kiss as usual, but instead sat down on the edge of the sofa to the left of my chair. I watched her with one eye while I followed the game with the other. Can we talk for a minute, Bob? She asked, in a voice that I could barely hear over the noise of the TV. By this point, she had my full attention. Of course, I answered. I noticed that there were beads of sweat on her forehead and she seemed to be breathing heavily. I wondered if anyone we knew had gotten sick or died. Can you turn off the TV, Bob? She asked, clenching and unclenching her fists. Turning off the TV in the middle of a Cubs game? She knew what she was asking. It had to be something serious. Death, not illness. I had an unpleasant feeling in my lower abdomen. I grabbed the remote and turned off the sound. What happened, baby? You don't look good. Did someone die? God, no. Nobody died, she answered quickly. It's just that this is very important to me, and I need to make sure you're listening to me completely. I nodded without saying anything. A traffic jam of bad thoughts formed in my brain. We sat staring at each other for at least half a minute. There was fear in her eyes and something else, perhaps anger. You know that I love you completely, and I would never cheat on you. I would never date another man behind your back, right? This wasn't exactly the question I was expecting. Suddenly the dinner I had eaten earlier in the evening and the two beers I had drunk during the game seemed to want to come back, right there on the living room floor. I nodded silently again. I'm 45 years old, Bob. I've only slept with one man in my entire life besides you, she began. I'm still an attractive woman. My friends even say that I am a hot mom. I, I, I want to sleep with another man just once, so I can feel the thrill of meeting a new man, another man, one more time, before you and I grow old together. What the hell is this? I sat motionless. I don't know how long. It sounded like a speeding train was passing right next to my ears. No, no, absolutely not, I shouted back, jumping out of my chair. This won't happen as long as I'm breathing. She looked at me with wide eyes as I paced back and forth. It must have been a bad dream. I must have fallen asleep in my chair and found myself in the middle of a nightmare. This has nothing to do with you and me, Bob. It's all about me, my needs as a woman. Come first as far as you and our family are concerned, she said, her voice seeming to grow stronger and more confident as she spoke. I think I've been a pretty good wife and mother all these years. I always, always put family first. This time I need to do something for myself. I need to do this to feel like a sexy woman. A sexy woman in control of her life. Don't you feel like a sexy woman with me? I asked, realizing that I sounded like a whiny loser. I tell you that I love you all the time. I think I'm constantly showing you that you are a sexy woman. I still lust after you, and I'm pretty sure I'm not hiding it too much. You do, and I like it, but it's about... something else. My ego still needs validation. From men other than you, Bob. 
It's nice when other men notice you. It's wonderful to think that another man would want me that way. Don't you feel good when you see a woman looking at you or flirting with you? I am no different from others. I like it when people look at me with lust. And after all this time, I want more. I'd love to experience going on a date, getting wine and dinner, so to speak, and then another man taking you and lusting after you. Just for one night. Not love, just lust. For one night. Then I would come home to you and be yours, to be a simple wife and mother for the rest of my life. You are anything to me, just not a simple wife and mother, blonde. I objected. You are all for me. I can't let you go to another man. I won't let you go to another man. You keep telling me that you love me. Why don't you show me how much you love me by giving me this? I know this is a big ask. The biggest. And it would be the greatest gift for me if you would allow me to do this, she said. No, it would be the greatest stupidity on my part to let you do this. If you really loved me, you wouldn't even ask, I said. Haven't I been a good wife to you and a good mother to our children? Shouldn't that entitle me to free travel? You had many more women than I had men before we got married. I'm just trying to even the score a little, she said. We actually never discussed numbers before we got married. All we really discussed was how we both believed in fidelity after marriage. And for your information, I've only slept with four women in my life, including you. Not exactly a long list, I said. Oh, I always thought so. You have much more experience than me, she said. You know much more than I do. I read a lot on this topic. I want to give you as much pleasure as possible. So it's still hard for you to say yes? She asked. Not only a categorical no, but also that I will be meeting with a lawyer first thing Monday morning to begin divorce proceedings, I said as shock showed on her face. But, 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 she stammered. I understand how hard it must have been for you to ask for a pass, so that tells me you're really serious about this. That tells me you're not going to let it go so easily, I said. That means you'll end up going behind my back to get your way. I no longer trust that you won't do it. Unless you already did, and it was just a smokescreen to get permission after the fact. No, I swear to you that until now, I have not slept with anyone. I said I wouldn't cheat on you, and I meant it, she whined but you would think that now that I know you want it, doing it now wouldn't be cheating, I said, looking straight at her. Her inability to hold my gaze told me all I needed to know. You want to destroy our family even though I haven't done anything yet? She asked hoarsely. If you finally have the courage to ask, it means you've been planning this for a long time. And that tells me that you've already chosen a goal. He was probably involved in planning this too. Lunch? Dinners? You've already cheated on me, at least emotionally. By the way, who is he? I asked. I didn't choose anyone in particular, she said, staring at a spot on the wall over my shoulder. The silence lasted about 15 seconds while I stared at her. She turned bright red when she looked at me and realized that I was looking at her with disbelief on my face. You don't need to know, Bob, she said quietly. You're right. I don't need to know but I want to know the name of the person who is ruining what I thought was a wonderful marriage. You can tell me, or I can call all your close friends, and also your boss, and all your colleagues and ask them, I said. Her mouth dropped open in shock. Y y y you wouldn't, she began to say. I would not? What do I have to lose? My life is in a ditch and my marriage is falling apart. What should bother me? What about my embarrassment? She squealed. I shrugged and tried my best to hide my smile. Name? I asked sharply. Dan. Dan Wilson, she said quietly. Please, Bob, don't hurt him. I don't guarantee anything. I grabbed the remote and turned the game back on. She chuckled, brushed away her tears, got up from the couch and went upstairs to our bedroom. My eyes watched the rest of the Cubs game, but nothing registered in my brain. I can't even tell you what appeared on the screen after the game, but I know I sat in front of the TV for at least two more hours. Although I think I did a pretty good job of hiding most of my feelings from my wife, I was actually devastated. I had no idea that my wife was planning to sleep with another man. Looking back, 
I suppose I should have seen signs of her dissatisfaction with me, or her life, or something else. Over the past three months, Tracy has become somewhat distant, not only from me, but also from our children. In fact, my daughter Sherry was the first to notice. Asking me if Tracy and I had been arguing, I noticed that the intimacy between us had also decreased. Sex two or three times a week dropped to once every two weeks, and not for lack of trying. I wondered if some early changes were happening to her. Then there were phone calls that were received outside the room, something that almost never happened until recently. In addition to almost constant evening text messages, when I asked about it, she stated that it was Lisa who was having problems with her husband Jerry. This was more than interesting because Jerry and Lisa lived just three doors down from us, and I had no idea they were having any problems. I spent the rest of the weekend intensely considering my options. I told Tracy that I was going to file for divorce as quickly as possible, but first I needed to look into every aspect of it, my marriage and my family. I could certainly understand how another man could lust after my Tracy. She was a beauty when I met her when we were both 21, and at 45 she was only five kilic heavier despite having two children. Her nice-sized breasts were combined with a firm ass, and her face made her look more like a 35-year-old. I always wondered how I came to know Tracy. She was clearly above my pay grade. Not that I'm a troll or anything, I'm decent looking. But guys who look like me don't often date the prom queen she was just three years ago as a high school senior. In junior high, we both took the same astronomy class at Purdue University. I took it just for fun, while Tracy needed the course to fulfill her academic requirements. I'm something of a nerd in that sense. And Tracy realized pretty quickly that I would be happy to help her pass the exam since science isn't her strong suit. It was nearing the end of the first semester, and we were studying in my dorm room when Tracy leaned over and kissed me hard on the lips. I kissed her back just as hard. Damn, I spent most of the semester thinking you were gay, Tracy told me when we broke at the kiss. No matter what outfit I wore, you never seem it interested. I was interested, but I wouldn't think it was mutual. I was just trying my best not to drool in front of you, I said. We immediately became exceptional. I didn't have much sexual experience, but I assumed she had even less because she never complained and seemed quite happy with everything I tried in bed, thanks to my voracious reading on the subject. While all the other guys my age were watching porn, I was reading about the activities that everyone was watching. With Tracy, this came in handy from the very beginning. The second time we made love, I made her faint by running my tongue below her waist. At first I was worried because none of my three previous partners had ever fainted, but I decided that she was fine because she was still breathing. When she opened her eyes two minutes later, all she could mutter was, I love you, Bob. We got married two years after finishing school. Three years later, our son arrived, followed by our daughter. We were doing pretty well financially as I was an IT professional and she was working in a bank when she returned to work shortly after our youngest started school. Our son was getting ready to start his freshman year at Ohio State University in a couple of months. And our daughter was about to start high school. In two short years, we were to become orphans. Over the past few months, we have been discussing plans for our future, including travel. I loved this woman for almost 23 years. On the one hand, turning it down because she was asking for permission to cheat seemed overly harsh. But on the other hand, I have already noted that her going so far as to ask for cheating was a serious problem. I wasn't born yesterday. I knew that if she was so desperate to be allowed to cheat, she would be desperate enough to go behind my back, especially since she had already told me about it and didn't view it as cheating, although I did. Of course. There was also the issue that she and Dan Wilson were already having an emotional affair, and they were planning this night of physical infidelity together. Will I ever be able to forgive this? I called my divorce lawyer first thing Monday morning and made an appointment for Thursday afternoon. Meanwhile, on the home front, Tracy tried her best to convince me not to file for divorce. We didn't do anything, Bob. We won't do anything, Tracy cried. Because you don't want a divorce or because you know it's wrong, I asked. She didn't look at me and didn't answer. You're still hoping that I'll change my mind and let you, aren't you? This caused her to look full of hope, which, unfortunately, 
predetermined our fates. I sent Tracy to court a week after meeting with my lawyer. We lived in a prosperous state and made about the same money, so finances were easy. There were almost no children at home, so housing issues were dealt with as they went along, and the non-custodial parent was responsible for the child's upkeep for one year. We would sell the house and split the proceeds. Boom. It is done. Twenty-one years. Ended. Not so fast. Tracy hired a pretty smart lawyer who convinced the judge to order four sessions of psychological help and more if she felt it was necessary. The consultant, a woman in her mid-thirties, shared the same opinion as my children and Tracy. Since my wife had not actually committed adultery, why did I feel like divorce was my only option? I told the counselor the same thing I told Tracy and my kids, that I think her request to have sex outside of our marriage is tantamount to breaking our vows. Because of this, I no longer trusted her as a marriage partner. I may still love her to some extent, but I couldn't stay married to a woman I couldn't trust. But I'll never try anything like that again, Bob. I don't need anyone but you, please, she begged over and over for most of the two sessions. You'll never change your mind, will you, Mr. Rasmussen? I can see it in your eyes, the consultant said towards the end of the second session. I'm going to put an end to this farce and tell the judge to grant the divorce smoothly. My personal opinion doesn't matter, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I think you are making a huge mistake. Your wife has not cheated on you, at least not physically, so it sounds like you would like to get some marriage counseling to save your marriage for the long haul. Your wife seems willing to make any concessions you want to save your marriage and your family. I know I winced and sighed. I loved Tracy to death. I made this decision without flipping a coin. There is a difference between the way you and I look at things, Dr. Baker. You called it a concession. I don't think her promise to be faithful is a concession. I think it's called honoring the wedding vows she made to me 21 years ago that she planned to break with another man, I explained. My in-laws practically had a meltdown when Tracy told them about the divorce. My mother-in-law called me the next day and screamed insults for a good 15 minutes, taking only one breath during the whole diatribe. She started screaming right after I said hello. My father-in-law, who has always been the more rational person, took the phone from her while she was still screaming. She didn't even cheat on you, and you're divorcing her? After 21 years? Are you completely crazy, Bob? He yelled. I told him my version of what happened, and I heard him make small, strangled sounds as I told it. From time to time, he would quietly say, Really? And then I continued. At the end of the conversation, he seemed much more depressed in spirit. Finally, he said, Sorry, Bob, and quietly hung up. The following week, I moved into a two-bedroom apartment next door. My daughter has decided to live in the house with my wife for the next year until she goes off to college but I thought a second room would come in handy if either of the kids wanted to stay for a while. They were both upset with me, although they seemed to understand why I was divorcing their mother. I had a friendly phone conversation with my neighbor Jerry a few days after I moved into my apartment. I told him that his wife Lisa had a hand in my wife's plans with Dan Wilson and that Tracy claimed that he and Lisa were having marital problems. I told him I didn't think he had anything to do with the end of my marriage, but his wife was somehow involved and given how close he and Tracy were, Lisa was also looking for a young stud to have some fun with. Oh, shit, Jerry croaked over the phone. So you mean that I might have problems too? Does your lawyer give group quotes? The phenomenon of social networks has both positive and negative sides. The good thing for me was getting all sorts of information about one Dan Wilson without even having to hire a private investigator. Saved me a lot of money. Wilson was a colleague of Lisa's and had transferred to the local office from Cleveland about six months before my marriage ended. He had a very pretty fiancé who was still looking for work in our city, so he came home almost every weekend to see her. I wondered if Tracy even knew about the guy's fiancé. Now everything is lost, except for the phone call I made to Wilson's fiancé. Shortly after this, I heard from some sources that Dan's wedding had been called off and his fiancée had said that he could be with his old lady full-time. Did I mention that his fiancée was the daughter of a very rich man? 
Two weeks before the divorce was final, Tracy and I celebrated 22 years of marriage. I had to admit that I was hurting inside about what I had lost, but the longer I sat watching Swanson TV before dinner, the more I knew I was doing the right thing. I would have spent the rest of my life searching for evidence that she was cheating on me if I had stayed married. I knew with every fiber of my being that sooner or later she would find a way to cheat on me. She hated losing at anything and viewed not getting her way as a loss that needed to be corrected. I drank a single malt and was in bed by 10 p.m. Happy anniversary to me. My phone rang around 1 a.m. and I noticed it was my soon-to-be ex-wife. I thought about letting it go to voicemail, but since I was already awake, I answered the call. Ugh. 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 Ay. 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 Oh, hell yes! She screamed, apparently during lovemaking. I've heard those sounds often enough to know she wasn't faking it. There was another unintelligible squeal before Tracy urged her partner, presumably Wilson, to take her harder. I should have ended the conversation immediately, but I froze in place. I listened for another two minutes, long enough to hear Tracy's lover growl from his own release. Then I hung up before they started cooing at each other after sex, wishing I was on a landline so she could hear me slam the phone down. If I had even the slightest doubt that I was doing the right thing, it would seal our fate. On the advice of my lawyer, I got into the habit of recording all conversations with my wife. As I sat there, feeling like my blood pressure was about to skyrocket, I dialed my relative's number, and when my father-in-law confirmed his presence, I pressed play on the phone's recording app. I let him listen for a full three minutes, then ended the call. I was almost sure that this little one-act play would not be repeated in the future. Unlike my wife, I didn't use the charms of others until the divorce became official, and even then I didn't get a woman into bed for over a year. I admit that I had difficulties in my social life. It had been 24 years since I last went on a date, and since I never planned on dating again, I didn't keep up with dating developments. Stupid me. This turned out to be a failed strategy because the dating world certainly passed me by like a speeding freight train. I knew that part of my reluctance to date was in my heed. I was afraid that I would be caught off guard again. I loved Tracy, and I never foresaw what would happen to me. There was not even a hint. The only thing that was easy to notice that had changed since the last time I dated was the attitude of the women. When I was dating, everything was one-sided. The man chose a target. The man invited the specified target on a date. If said target said yes, the man would choose an activity and pay for everything. These days, women seem to spend almost half the time being the huntress or at least thinking about how the date should go. Sometimes they even paid for everything. There were times when I felt like a dinosaur trying to chase a cheetah. The date scene showed me that Tracy's sudden selfishness was not unicorn behavior. Along with feeling more empowered, today's dating women are definitely more self-centered. Many of them wanted their own way, even to the detriment of their partners. If it was good for them, then it would be good for their partners and their loved ones. Been there, done that, and all this recently. I'm not going to complain about the physical aspects of sex with a woman in her 20s. Okay, the first few times women nearly killed me. I was pretty sure I pulled a muscle. However, once I got used to physical intimacy, the level of pleasure went through the roof. I'm not saying Tracy wasn't good in bed, but at 45 she didn't have the energy and flexibility of a 20-year-old. Of course, I also did not have the regenerative abilities of a 20-year-old man, but I still knew something that would please a girl. However, it was not only about younger women. I've dated and made love to, women ranging from about 25 to 55. I guess you could call me an equal opportunity enthusiast. However, I always primarily looked for women around my age, in my comfort zone, so to speak. It had been a busy week, and after finishing a meeting with a new client on the other side of town, I walked into the bar of an upscale hotel, still dressed in my suit. I sat on a high stool at the bar and ordered a single malt Glenmorangie. It was about 7 p.m. when I walked in, and about an hour later, a group of women from the bachelorette party were seated at tables marked reserved. There must have been about 15 of them, and they were all quite noisy. 
I decided to stay a little longer and watch the fun, so I ordered food from the bar. The bride-to-be was, of course, the star of the show, and I noticed she was a pretty girl of about twenty-five with waist-length light brown hair and big brown eyes. I admit that I'm a fan of long hair, so she kind of grabbed me and I focused on her for a few minutes before I started paying attention to the other party-goers. That's when I noticed her. I guessed she was about forty years old, and from her age I knew she was a companion for the evening, an older mother hen who was taken along to look after the innocent and not-so-innocent younger chicks. The first thing I noticed was that she seemed a little nervous in her mid-thigh-length black skirt, which seemed to ride up a little higher on her legs as she sat on the chair. Several times during the first few minutes, she tried unsuccessfully to pull up her skirt. I smiled to myself. She really had beautiful legs. She also seemed to have impressive breasts, not entirely hidden by the tight, lavender silk blouse she was wearing. The blouse had a V-neck, with a cut that reached the middle of her large breasts and showed that her alabaster skin was not often exposed to the sun. When she wasn't worrying about the length of her skirt, she was looking down at her chest. I'm guessing to make sure there isn't too much creamy skin showing. Her whole outfit was probably a little youthful for her comfort, and I assumed it had been made for her by one of the young women in the group. I mentally praised whoever had chosen it and convinced her to wear it. The women definitely seemed to be enjoying themselves, laughing, drinking and eating, and when the three-piece combo started playing, several of the women got up and started dancing with each other. The woman dancing together seemed to encourage the other men at the bar, who began to approach the women on the dance floor and those sitting at the table, with the exception of their companion. I waited about ten minutes, and when no one moved towards the escort, I decided that the way was clear and heated towards her. She had shoulder-length dark brown hair and bright green eyes that reminded me of Jacqueline Bessette in her heyday. Equally important, she was not wearing a wedding ring. She blushed a gorgeous pink when I asked her to dance. At first she hesitated, but then she agreed, and several young women sitting nearby expressed their sorrow to her as she stood up, straightened her skirt, and took my hand. The first two dances were quick, and I had to silently thank my ex-wife for insisting that I learn to dance. The next dance was slow, and I was a little surprised when she pressed her curvy body against me. Her hair smelled like white lilies, and I chuckled to myself because this perfume is not very popular among young women. We actually talked a little while we were sliding around the dance floor. I learned that her name was Kathleen Franks. She was the aunt of the bride and party attendant. She thanked me for dancing and started to walk off the dance floor after slow dancing, but I took her hand and invited her to join me at the bar. She began to protest that she needed to keep an eye on her girls. But I pointed out to her that she could see them perfectly well from my seat at the bar. We watched the young women and talked. I found out that she was actually 48 years old and divorced after 15 years of marriage. She told me that her husband, a man of means, traded her for a trophy wife who was 27 to his 48 when he married her three years ago. She also told me that her outfit was chosen for her by her niece, her fiancé, and that she felt it was a little youthful for her since she usually dresses more conservatively. I commented that her outfit suited her perfectly, and I was completely out of my mind when I told her that I absolutely loved her sexy heels. Years ago, I learned that women seem to really enjoy having their shoes complimented. Don't you think I look out of place in this outfit? She asked innocently. Not in the least. Sorry to say this, but you look good enough to eat. While I used to love pink blush, I now love the deep red one she showed off. We talked for about 15 minutes. She noticed that I wasn't wearing a wedding ring and wanted to know the story. She expressed surprise when I said that my ex-wife had never actually physically cheated on me. I'm really old-fashioned, I explained. She cheated on me emotionally and planned to do it physically. I couldn't trust her anymore. You don't tell someone you love them, but you want to have sex with someone else. I understand that, she replied. Everyone should have a line in the sand. She returned to the bridal table a few minutes later, but was more than receptive when I asked her to dance again about 30 minutes later. This time, when we were finished, 
She took my hand and led me back to the table with the other women, where there were now several more men. From my point of view, the evening was a success, despite the fact that the young women were a little loud. I was very surprised when Katie invited me to be her wedding date in two weeks. I was going to go alone, but I know I would be better off spending time with you. I know we just met, but you've already met a lot of the girls who will be there too, she said. Besides, you would be doing me a big favor because I wouldn't be there alone and look really pathetic. I definitely wouldn't want you to look pathetic. I would be more than happy to accompany you to the wedding, I said. Tell me what color you will be wearing, and I will choose the suit I have that goes best with it. She leaned towards me and quickly pecked me on the lips. Oh la la, came the chorus from the other end of the table. I smiled brightly while Katie blushed again. I could get used to this. I sat with Katie when we weren't dancing. During one of these moments, as we sat at the table, I kept my eyes on the girls at the bachelorette party, some of whom were clearly overdoing their drinking. I'm the father of a teenage girl, so it wasn't unusual for me to be in dad mode with the young women around me. When I saw the young man take one of the girls by the hand and begin to lead her towards the toilets, I apologized, stood up from the table and quickly and quietly walked towards them, reaching them just before the guy was about to push the girl to the men's room. The young man looked at me with contempt, apparently unafraid of the older guy in a shirt and tie. I admit that I would never scare anyone at first sight, but I would like to think that I am still in good physical shape and I had my fair share of troubles as a child. Sometimes you have to be prepared for some violence to do the right thing, which in this case meant protecting some young girl from becoming this guy's sex toy. I would hope that someone would step in and protect my little girl if the situation called for it. Let go of my hand and get away from me, old man, he growled at me. She's old enough to play if she wants. I let go of his hand, but with the other hand, I grabbed his head and hit it hard against the wall on the side of the door. I pushed him hard enough to break the drywall, bloodying his face and stunning him. Suddenly, he didn't seem so confident and let the girl go. He also didn't seem to want this controversy anymore. The club became quiet as people realized what had just happened. Just as I started to lead Alicia back to the bachelorette party, Katie and the rest of the group walked up to us, grabbed the woman, and led her back to the table. I was left standing face to face with the restaurant manager and another employee. I thought I was in trouble until the manager extended his hand and thanked me for helping the young woman. The police were called. This guy is going to jail. They'll probably want your information and your side of the story, but I don't think you have anything to worry about. By the way, drinks for the rest of the evening are at the expense of the establishment. Thanks again, he said. Wow. That was some crazy shit, Wanda, the bride-to-be, said as I returned to the table. Thank you for paying attention, not only to Aunt Katie. How did you see it? Katie asked me. I was supposed to be the chaperone, and I had no idea what was going on. I feel pretty awkward about this. It is not your fault. It's easy to lose track of 14 girls in a bar unless you're a professional security guard or a father. Fathers, at least most of us, have what I call a father's vision. I chatted and smacked with the women at the table until they decided to leave and spend the rest of the evening somewhere else. I kissed Katie softly on the lips as we said goodnight to each other, feeling pretty good and having her number in my phone. Get a room, said one of the girls to the hoarse laughter of the group. I gently licked my lips and tasted Katie's lipstick as I watched the women leave the restaurant. I took my drink back to the seat at the bar I had previously occupied. Looks like you did pretty well, the bartender chuckled as I sat back down. Who would have known? I answered with a laugh. Hen party? Give me one for the trail so I can celebrate my good fortune before I go. My new best friend, Sean the bartender, earned himself a double whiskey as his tip for the evening. Katie's dress for the wedding was light blue, so I wore my dark blue pinstripe suit, which I consider my me-room suit. I thought we made a beautiful couple, as did several of her relatives at the wedding. Several people came up to me at the wedding and thanked me for looking after Alicia. Apparently the bride had spent the previous two weeks telling anyone who would listen that I was some sort of hero. Heroic and beautiful, what a wonderful combination, said Kathy's sister, Donna Fulham, the bride's mother. 
as she approached us to introduce herself to me before the wedding. Thank you for helping the girls a couple of weeks ago and for making my sister look like she has improved taste in men. I also met Katie's 24-year-old daughter, Marissa, and her fiancé, Ben. Well, at least one of my parents isn't begging for dates in elementary school, Marissa said when she met me. Dad will definitely hate you if you stay here long enough to be introduced. By the time the reception ended, I knew Katie and I would go the distance. A month later, I introduced her to my children. My son quickly became attached to her, but my daughter was a little standoffish. She was still a little mad at me for divorcing her mother, even though your mom didn't even cheat on you. However, my son understood it. He had a serious girlfriend, and one evening we discussed fidelity and what it meant to each of us at length. My wife Kathy and I retired several years ago. We celebrated our anniversary with a cruise to Alaska. With the help of Daily Cialis and Astroglide, we make love every morning before showering and getting on with our lives. At our age, it's more about connection than sex. All three of our children are married and successful. In total, we have six grandchildren. I've only spoken to my ex-wife maybe a couple dozen times since our divorce, counting our children's weddings and Christmas holidays. She was married and divorced a second time. My kids tell me that she blames me for her life being the way it is. I never actually cheated on him, she still tells them. Some people just don't understand it.